Good evening. First, I'd like to give thanks to the Lord for the honor and the blessing to be among you tonight. I'd like to thank Father Tom for um, inviting me again. And uh, before I begin, I want to share with you the word I was just reading. And I was reading from Ephesians 6, 10. Be strong in the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord with his energy and strength. Put on the whole armor of God to be able to resist the cunning of the devil. Our battle is not against human forces, but against the rulers and authorities and the dark powers that govern this world. We are struggling against the spirits and supernatural forces of evil. Therefore, Put on the whole armor of God, that in the evil day you may resist and stand your ground, making use of all your weapons. Take truth as your belt, justice as your breastplate, and zeal as your shoes to propagate the gospel of peace. Always hold in your hand the shield of faith to repel the flaming arrows of the devil. Finally, use the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. Pray at all times as the Spirit inspires you. Keep watch together with sustained prayer and supplication for all the holy ones. Pray also for me so that when I speak, I may be giving words to proclaim bravely the mystery of the gospel. Even when in chains I am an ambassador of God, may he give me the strength to speak as I should. So tonight I'm here to share with you this moment and it is a grace for me and an honor and at the same time it is um, a great responsibility to be able to just open the heart with all of you together for us to ask the Holy Spirit to come and feed us and strengthen us. As St. Paul was just teaching us through his word, we are not only dealing with all these daily endeavors, we are not only dealing with this physical life, we, we have a lot to care, a lot to be concerned about as far as what we are dealing with that we cannot see. And we are very little naturally dealing with it. Uh, we all have a different conception of what we cannot see. And in faith, we face some levels of it. But we will always ask ourselves, are we really truly doing enough to really face what we don't see? And I don't say face only in the uh, direction of the enemy, also face in the direction of the responsibilities that we have as children of God. We have been supernaturally anointed, and we have been given not only the gifts of the Spirit, uh, but we have been given a task, a mission to fulfill. And the more we embrace that mission, the more peace and joy we find. The less we embrace that mission, the less peace and joy we have. And that is like a law that we cannot avoid. And our faith, is simple. Our faith appears to be very complicated, sophisticated, and extremely unfathomable, but for people that are not willing to obey. But when you find yourself in obedience to God, you begin to realize what Jesus told us, that his yoke is light, and his commandments are easy to obey. And it is only because of the understanding we we get to achieve when we love God and we search to just find more and more about Him and learn more about Him, that we realize that it's easy to obey, it's easy to follow. And our life becomes much lighter, even though the trials, toils, and tribulations of this earthly life might be going on in our lives in the same intensity, but still, they do not feel the same way. 
because we are able to cope with them and to deal with them with the strength of the spirit and that makes a big difference. It is very different to deal in life with everyday endeavors when you have the love of God because then you have the strength and the power to maintain your spirit within the peace and the love that God gives you. That's why when people love, they are never exhausted of giving. They are always willing to give, and giving gives them strength. They are strengthened by giving, because they are not expecting to be strengthened by receiving or by taking. And this is a law that we should be careful of and understand how it plays, how it goes. Because the world we live in today is teaching us how to take, but it's not teaching us how to give. The world is open to offer us all kinds of opportunities for us to take, and is not teaching us how to give. So God comes along and teaches us how to be in this world, but belonging to Him, not being of the world. And the way we are not of the world is when we understand that it's not about taking, but it is about giving. And in order to understand how to give, first you have to understand how to love. And the love of God could only be understood when you learn that by giving, you are actually receiving. And this is a very plain and simple mystery. When you read the Gospel of St. John, and you read St. John all around, you read about love, about the true love of God. And then based on all this amazing love that he received from Jesus, reason, the reason why he was the apostle that made it to the foot of the cross, an apostle that was so showered with the love of Jesus that every word he wrote is, 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 a, is a word of immense love. And the teachings are that when we learn to give, the love of God flows through us, feeds our neighbor and strengthens our soul. And it is the only food, the only true food of the soul. Because for us, to be truly strengthened by the Eucharist, which is our bread of life, we have to be open to the love of God by reconciling with God and neighbor and reconciling with self also. Because we have an understanding of reconciliation when we belong to the world that has nothing to do with true peace with God. It's a reconciliation with self and the world, which is based on your expectations of the world. That is a plain human reconciliation, very easy to achieve. People are naturally politically correct because they go for what they need and for what they want, and they negotiate peace according to convenience. Many people are married for convenience. A lot of people are friends for convenience. A lot of people have relationships only because they have common interests, but they don't necessarily have love. So when we understand love, true love, unconditional love, then we know that to be married is to love, really to give unconditionally, to have a partnership, is to truly love. If we are talking about being children of God, and then the understanding of that comes along with the, the fruits that you will receive from this knowing how to love unconditionally. You see people that are joyful and peaceful in spite of what they can go through in this life. And they are a joy to see because they give hope to the communities, to the family. They give hope to this world of darkness and this world of negativity. And they are the light and the tower of hope for everyone. And that's what we are called to do. Because you see a lot of people in the church and sometimes you wonder, a lot of people in the church that appear to be such good Catholics, but you don't necessarily see them joyful. 
You don't necessarily see them peaceful. And you wonder, what is going on when our faith is to give us the most immense joy in spite of it all? Because God came to give us a spirit of joy and peace. A spirit that will give us the strength to be the true apostles we are called to be. And an apostle that is sad and disheartened and negative and depressed will not get the gospel anywhere. And we are messengers of that gospel, each one of us. It's not only the priest, it's not only the religious in the monastery, and it's not only the consecrated laity, it's each one of us. Each one of us is called to go out there into our little life and to bring that love and that presence of God from everything we do, instead of expecting the world and people to be the ones to give us that. That way we stop being those that are searching for a self-realization and trying to find the ultimate goal, searching for the philosophical stone. And I don't know how many other goals that will never feed you, will never fulfill you, and will never give you the peace and the joy that God will give you if you are unconditionally just focused on doing the service that God is asking you to give, that spirit of service where you are last and everyone else is first. And I know this sounds amazing, con amazingly contradictory to everything we are built on, like in this world. We are educated, we are taught not to do that because we are supposed to be first, we are supposed to be the best, we are to be the ones that succeed before everybody else because we are to compete and make sure we succeed in everything we do. And there is nothing wrong with success, nothing wrong, as long as we are succeeding for everybody and especially to glorify God. That is good, it's good success. But the success we learn naturally is a success just to take advantage, advantage of people, advantage of opportunities and the moment of your life. And then the teachings of the Gospels are very different. We as Catholics, we come to this church and we come to Mass. We exercise our sacraments, come to confession, we baptize the children, we come for a wedding, we bury our dead, we do so many things, we celebrate anniversaries, we do many things with our religion, and that makes us happy because it makes us feel that we have a God among us, and then we are worshiping God in so many different beautiful ways. But at the same time, God wants us to do much more than that. Because if you really understand the message of Jesus, Jesus was never telling the apostles that they were doing enough, never congratulating them, not because he was unjust, just because he was a perfect master. He was always demanding more from them. And that is what God wants from us much more than what we're doing. It's not only to come and bury the dead. It's not only to come for a wedding. It's not only to baptize. It's also to bring this goodness of God to everybody wherever we are, every day of our life. And I know that this is probably a pretty old sermon. But I am just a simple man that comes out of the streets. I am just a regular layman that was like a falling away Catholic most of my life. And the Lord rescued me out of the darkness and brought me into the light, back into the light. And I can only say today, what a waste when you have been given all the gifts of this magnificent, mighty church of God and to let it go and exchange it for the idols of this world. What a waste. And what a gift to be part of the church, be active in the church, and be willing to give it all to the Lord and to see the magnificent response of the Lord that is so faithful that when we give just a little bit, the Lord comes in and gives us a thousandfold. He overflows the graces to us when we give Him anything, any little thing. It's like... It's like a, the most magnificent partner, the most magnificent, magnificent father, the most magnificent fountain, endless fountain of mercy, so abundant and so rich in gifts. And here we are, when we speak about our faith, many people wonder what kind of gifts 
one or the other has. And the truth is this, we have been given all the gifts. We are not lacking any. The thing is that most of the gifts are dormant, and they are dormant because what we have active in our lives is self, is active, is too active. And then the gifts of the Spirit are dormant, shy, they are not in action because we are not letting the Spirit act. And that is the calling of a spiritual reflection like the one today. We are called for a moment of reflection in the middle of our life. We are here now and we came from where we came and we are going to where we're going. But this moment of reflection before the Lord calls us to place our hearts humbly before the Lord to be examined for a moment and to look at ourselves and find out what are we up to today and what are we up to in our lives. We have to realize something very important. What is the greatest priority we have right now? What is the most important thing in your life at this moment? Is it a human being? Is it your money? Is it your worries? Is it the goals you, you haven't achieved yet? Is it all the possessions you don't have yet? What is it? What is the most thing, the most important thing in your life right now? And if we are to reflect spiritually about your most important thing in your life right now, and we were to, to discover it, I would say the most important thing in our life right now will be to realize how fragile, how short, how limited our earthly life is. It is so short that it could end today. So if we really are to talk about what is important and the priority of our life, it will be how much am I concerned about my salvation? Because if I am working on my salvation, I am working on salvation of everybody. Because when I am concerned about striving for holiness in order to achieve the salvation of my soul, I am sanctifying everyone and everything around me. Because if you strive to be good, if all you want in your life is to become a better person all the time, that means you're striving for holiness. And everyone around you will benefit. And your life will bloom. And you will give fruits of the Spirit for everybody else to be benefit. And you will stop searching for the goals, the temporary goals, that will only bring you temporary benefits. And it will not benefit anyone around you but you. Only you. Because at the end, what you want to realize of this world is to satisfy your appetites, your instincts, your senses, your reason. But if you are really understanding the gospel and understanding what Jesus is asking from us, then you understand the most important part. He's asking us to become very little, very small, very simple, so that he can grow. And that is the most important message of the gospel. You hear St. John the, the uh, Baptist t talking to his disciples, and he's saying, I have to diminish so he can grow. St. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Jesus who lives in me. And it's a great teaching when Jesus tells us that we have to be like little children in order to enter the kingdom. And think about this. We are built on the opposite direction. The teaching of this world are about you being big, about you being important, about you succeeding and going ahead of the game, like they say. It's about building up. It's not about being little. So if we understand the ways of the world, then we are understanding the ways of God. Because the ways of God are the opposite. That's what it is, like the scandal of the cross. Because the cross, the way of the cross is scandalous for the world. People do not understand what it means to turn the other cheek. People do not understand what it means to forgive. It does, you, people don't understand. If you read the events of the Middle East conflicts, and you understand the conflicts between Muslims and Jews. 
you know there is something there that is lacking. And you know what is lacking? The sense of reconciliation because they are not redeemed and they don't know how to forgive because they have not accepted the Messiah, they are not redeemed, they don't know how to forgive. They are under the Italian law. One eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. They have accounts pending forever because the law, Moses' law teaches them just to take revenge on anything the neighbor will do against them. So when will they have peace? Only when Jesus comes back. Because that, we pray for peace every day. And we pray that there is peace in the world everywhere. But at the same time, we have to understand, peace only comes with reconciliation. When we reconcile, when we forgive. And how do we understand forgiveness? See, we are built on divisions. The natural way of living is we are separated, divided by races, by religions, by politics, by cultures, by traditions, by economies, by idiosyncrasies, and an uncountable number of divisions. So, if we strive to be spiritual, as St. Paul teaches us, we are to be of the spirit. Because if we are of the spirit, we will live forever. We will not die. If we are of the flesh, we will die. So if we are to be spiritual, the first thing we have to understand is how to truly love and be above our divisions, above our basic human nature, about, about our basic human existence. We have to be able to raise above culture, above races, above traditions, above, above economies, above ideologies, philosophies, ideas we have of self and ideas we have of others. Not until you are able to look around and look at everybody else's and begin to see them as a soul, you could say that you are a spiritual. You are probably religious, but maybe not a spiritual. A lot of religious people are racist. A lot of religious people are politically correct and politically divided and separated from other groups. And it's not enough because for us to really true, truly involve our hearts with the love of God, we have to learn to see each other as a soul. A soul. Imagine you have to raise yourself above all your selection. We select people. Sometimes we don't even know people and we don't like them. And we don't know anything about them. And we already dislike them and despise them. And we probably will not do anything for them even if we see them in trouble. That's how far we are from love. So the calling of love is to understand how much of an effort we have to make in order to raise above all these basic ground divisions that we are growing up with. And that is a good challenge. It will be wonderful if you dare to go on your knees and humble enough yourself to ask the Lord to make you so loving to everyone that you will not even recognize yourself. That will be wonderful, that you cannot even recognize yourself. That you could walk around and look at people and see them equally and then care for them and, and care so much that you could pray for them. Care so much that it will hurt you to know how much in trouble they could be and it will make you joyful to, to know how joyful they could be. And all of these things will change your life. Because you see, Jesus walking through Calvary is a Jesus that being innocent was carrying a cross with the wake of the sins of the whole humanity. And he was feeling the wake of that cross. And then the calling of Jesus is for us to learn to carry the wake of the sins of humanity, to, to carry the wake of the hurt of humanity, of the pain of humanity. And that will help us to understand the cross in the right direction. Not to go at the foot of the cross to whine and cry for the benefit of our particular life which is the most common case. We come to church to beg the Lord to solve our temporary life. We come to church to beg the Lord 
to heal ourselves physically, mentally, sometimes even spiritually, to solve our temporary problems. And that is fine. God wants us to do that. But is that all that you have for God? Is that all that you do? Is that all that your religion is about? To come and whine before the Lord? And is that all you're doing? And is that all your contribution to this church, to this life, to yourself as a soldier of Christ? You see, we have to know and we have to find out who we really are as Catholics. Who are we? What is our contribution to the church? What is our contribution to the family? What is our contribution to the Spirit of God that wants to act through us? Because that is the reason why God gave us the Spirit, so that we could let all those, those gifts of the Spirit give fruit. And that fruit is an immense gift for humanity. Because when we as Christians allow ourselves to let the spirit of love flow through us into the neighbor's heart, then we are serving the purpose of our mission on earth. A lot of people are thinking that to discover, to find the will of God in your life, it takes a lot of running around, a lot of asking questions, a lot of gigantic and long spiritual direction, and so sophisticated theologies, and years and years of studying. And the answer is, that is not true. The will of God is that we are holy. That is the will of God. Because if we are holy, the rest is going to be done by the Lord. That's why the gospel says, God picks the lame to shame the wise. Because the wise thinks that with the wisdom accumulated has answers. And at the end, if the wise has no love of God, has no answers either. And you see that, sadly enough, sometimes with great sophisticated theologians. They spend years in the school, years, and they have diplomas. They are the best and the first invited everywhere. They are honored guests everywhere. And how sad it is to go to one of those conferences, to one of those talks, and walk away with an empty heart, because all you got were words and no spirit. So. Many times from the pulpit, the words fall right there. They don't travel to the hearts of people because our words, they have no love. They only have intelligence. And we don't need intelligence. We need love. We need to put love in the gospel. That way, that's why some of, of the areas of our church is undernourished, malnourished. Because we have a lot of proudful people in the church that are not loving. And that's why we are starving. We are starving of love. And people are empty of God because there is not a flow of humility between us. We have to begin to learn how to give and how to love one another before we are too concerned about learning too much. Because I tell you, one of our biggest weaknesses that comes from original sin is this thirst to know, this thirst for knowledge. And that is the fruit we ate that we were not supposed to eat. So much that Jesus wants us to forget that. And he wants us to remember love first, before knowledge, before anything. And it's not that knowledge is bad. No, because knowledge comes also from God. Is that we are to receive that knowledge and to broom, you know, to, to manicure that intelligence only if we have the love of God. Otherwise, we are empty. And it's not good to have what we have and to learn what we learn if we don't have the love to serve it and give it. You, could you imagine something worse, something more, uh, more horrifying than a person of authority in the church, a person of the authority in the family, a person of authority in the community that has no charity and is just a powerful human being? Could you imagine something more ugly than that? There is not. It's the most ugly thing in the world. When you see someone with authority filled with pride and no charity, it's devastating. It's like, a, it's like a poison. It's an absolute poison. Because what we are to do when we become masters of any given art, of any given authority, 
We have to be the most humble ones. We have to be the most charitable ones. We have to be the most, the little ones, even though we are the masters. Because that's what the gospel teaches. If you are the master, behave like you are the slave. And the slave knows that the master is also a son of God. And then we all have to be together in this understanding that the real master is God and not any, any one of us. We are playing different roles, each one of us. But do you think it makes any difference before the eyes of God what role you're playing? The only thing that matters is if you obey. If you do what God is telling you to do, that is what matters, not what you do. Because the, the parable of the workers shows you what God means by that. Everyone came to work at different times of the day, and they were all paid the same salary. And you have to understand what it means. It means it doesn't matter when you were called. It doesn't matter how much you have done. It doesn't matter about your position, who you are. What matters is the calling and the, and the obedience to the calling. If you obey and you went for what God called you to do, then you are in the love of God. And that is the most important part to realize. So today, we could sense in our hearts where we are. Because I could say, if I die right now, where will my heart be? And the gospel teaches us that my heart will be where my treasure is. So what was the most important thing in my life today? That's where I'm going to go. Where is my soul going to go? It's going to go to that treasure. And what is that treasure? A human being? Money? What is it? You see, if it's not God, then you're not going to God if you die today. That's why as Catholics, we have the greatest gift and the greatest education in order to understand where to go when we part. You know, we have the Blessed Sacrament in our parish. And the teaching of the Blessed Sacrament is to call us to bring our heart to the spiritual home. The spiritual home is our Blessed Sacrament. That's where we belong. Our heart belongs there. When you pray before you go to bed, you place all those prayers at the foot of your Blessed Sacrament. Because we are to have a parish. We are to belong to our parish. We are to love and serve our parish because that is the home of God in our lives. A loose wheel, someone that is roaming around with no home, no spiritual home, is someone that is missing, missing the center of this spiritual hierarchy of the church that is so powerful and is the greatest protection against the evil spirits that roam the earth. The earth, as St. Paul was teaching us in the word I just read, and the blessed sacrament, if it becomes for us our real treasure, do you know where your soul is going to go when you die? It's going to go right to the blessed sacrament. There is nothing worse than for you to die and not to have a spiritual direction. You see, a lot of people do not have a sense of a spiritual direction, even though they might be religious, but their heart is not focused spiritually in God in any given direction. That's why the gift of the Eucharist is one of the most, it is the most magnificent gift ever. Because if your heart is really centered in the Blessed Sacrament, and everything you do is related to this Blessed Sacrament, all your intentions, your sufferings, your joy, everything you bring by the Blessed Sacrament, then if you die, you will come right by the Blessed Sacrament and the spirits will not gonna be able to confuse you. That's why the church teaches us prayers for the moment of dying. You probably have prayed a lot and many times in church, prayers, preparation for dying. Many. So we have to understand that those are the vital moments of our spirituality. Our spirituality demands a responsibility. And the responsibility is to focus our hearts in the real treasure. Because if we focus our heart in the real treasure, at the end of this life, we will embrace that treasure. So today, I will say, 
God will always remind us while we are going through the exile, will always remind us what to do and what is the priority will always remind us. Once in a while, he will call us and he will call our attention and he will say, I'm ringing the bell. I am reminding you what you are facing. Are you preparing yourself truly, spiritually, for the journey ahead, the real journey ahead? You see, this is only the beginning of an eternal journey. And we are not even held responsible to embrace the responsibilities that we have. Because if we were, we will be so much ahead. We will be so much holier. And we will be so much giving. And that's why the Lord always brings any possible information that we could gather in order to remind us of what we really need to do and what really is important. What are the real priorities in our life? And it's important to focus on that. Maybe we don't hear much of that. You see, we hear a lot of reflections. We hear a lot of theology. But people are afraid to speak about the devil, afraid to speak about sin, afraid to speak about confession, afraid to speak about hell, afraid to speak about purgatory, because they are so politically correct, they don't want to scare people away. They don't want to compromise their relationship with people, even though they compromise in their relationship with God. But they don't care. People don't care anymore. But I think, obviously, not everybody is like that. Our church has very holy people, and there are some very courageous soldiers in the church, priests and nuns and laity that are courageous. But I'm saying it's very common today to see many people in the church like that, that are not willing to hear the gospel like it's written, like it's revealed, like it is. Only let's speak about salvation. Let's don't scare one another. Let's don't talk about evil. Let's don't talk about all the doom and gloom. And it's not that sin is doom and gloom. And it's not that hell and purgatory are doom and gloom when you speak about it. It is a reality that we are to face. And we are not to forget there is a hell. And there are many souls condemned. And it, this is not something I'm making up. This is something that is revealed to us by the, by the church. So many mystics in the church, doctors of the church, have seen hell and have revealed hell to us. Purgatory. There is a purgatory and it's a reality. There is a heaven and it's our ultimate reality, a promise of God. And there is an enemy, though it is defeated, because the devil has no power, only the power that we give him. But still, if we are weak, we give power to the wrong person and that person can destroy us. So we have to learn about it and we have to be aware of the dangers we have. We also have an army, so numerous, the army of God that is on our side. How many people really know that they have a guardian angel? They probably heard about it, but do they care? And do they have a real relationship? Maybe it's not correct to speak about that, but that makes you too religious, too mystical. Oh, that's things of the past. The, today's theology doesn't speak about angels. Those things are past. We don't talk about that today. So you are shy to speak about angels because it's not good to talk about angels today. But I say, it is good to talk about angels because it's a reality and God, God is not lying to us. He said that he gave us a guardian angel. So you think he was lying? He gave us a guardian angel and he's alive, it's real, he's with us. So why not have a relationship with our guardian angel? And why not admit and accept that we really have angels around us, good and bad? So all of those things are important to bring back into our faith, into our church, into our families. How many people have forgotten to pray together at home and they don't do it anymore? And you know, this is our stronghold, prayer together at home with the family. We, if we make a little effort to pray at home together every day, at least one prayer, 
how much greater it will be if we do more than one prayer. But that is so important. Those are the sacred traditions of the church. We are way too modern. Our church is too watered down in so many places. And we have to go back to the basis. We have to rescue the, the, the traditions that give us the real food and the real spiritual strength. Why are families falling apart? Why are children getting lost in the world? Why are people hating each other so much? Even though they are Christians, they have the sacraments, they have the church and the faith. Why? Because they don't pray anymore. Because they don't have a sense of community. Because they don't spend any time doing these little things that are so unimportant today and that have been important forever. Because it is the only way to maintain the spirit of God among us. And also to maintain the spirit of the love of God flowing through us. And this is the answer. If I make an effort to learn how to give to those that I'm not able to give, then I am beginning to grow spiritually. You see, like the gospel says, it's very easy to love those that love us. It's very easy to forgive those that forgive us. And it's very easy to help those that help us or benefit us. But it's not easy to do the opposite. So in order to truly grow spiritually and to understand that you're truly beginning to love unconditionally, you have to begin to love those that don't love you and to help those that don't help you and to support those that don't support you. And that is the beginning of true love in your heart. So love hurts. Charity hurts. And that is something you have to understand. It has to hurt. Otherwise, it wouldn't be real. Because it's too easy. If it is too easy, it's not working. But that doesn't mean that everything that is from God is difficult and hard. I'm not saying that. But building up your spiritual strength is going against the flow of your natural life that was keeping you away from the love of God. So in the beginning, you might find it hard. But then the more you do it, the easier it gets. And one day, you will naturally let go, and you will love unconditionally, unconditionally, and you don't even know how it happened. And you become that love, and that joy and peace finally is in your heart. Because if you are the typical faithful parishioner, the one that is always doing the right, the one that is always contributing, the one that is always praying, the one that seem to be faithful to the sacraments, but you still have no peace, you still have no joy, you still are depressed very easy, negative, losing faith very easily, then there is something wrong with your spiritual growth. And what is wrong is that somehow you are not letting the love of God flow through you. Somehow you are wanting to receive more than you are wanting to give. So you have to really set up a real conscious way of understanding what is wrong with you. And you're going to find that what is wrong with you for sure is going to be that you are not giving it all. You are holding back for yourself too much. And that's why that love and that peace is not flowing and is not giving you peace and joy. So today, the Lord asks us in a very simple way, to be little, to be small, to be simple, to stop being these gigantic human beings, to stop being so important, to stop being so distinguished, to stop being so intelligent, to stop being so powerful and so righteous and so holy and begin being simple, small, basic and elemental so that the Holy Spirit can actually work through us. It's the only way we can get it. Otherwise, we never get it. If you come with your pride and your knowledge and your authority and your money and your political positions and social positions and your want and desire, you will never know love and you will never give love to anybody because all you're doing is defending human territories. I am who I am and who are you? And this is the beginning of evil. Today, the Lord is asking us something much more simple than that. I am not. I am not. I am nothing. He is. And we have to understand that. He is. And there is only one I am. 
only one, one God. So if there is only one I am, then who am I? So I am the one who is not. So therefore, for me to be, God has to be in me. It's the only way. And for God to be in me, I have to disappear. I have to be absolutely small. And then I will be because he is in me. And that is the beginning of humbleness, true humility. He has to come from there. I have to be last. Everybody else should be first. That sounds very difficult. But I tell you, with God, everything is possible. And you will feel the true joy if you learn to be last. If you learn to let them, let them, let them go their ways. And you, like, like the apostle says, if they ask you for your shirt, give them the cape also. And then you'll be fine. Don't fight it. Don't try to hold on into your territory and trying to grasp what is yours. No, let them have it. Let them have it all. And then you will see God come in. God will come in. And everything will be magnificent. Because then you know that it's not you. It's only one I am. And this is what we have to know. He is, I'm not. And that is the beginning of truth. If he is and I am not, I am really walking in the right path. Because then I really want to be, but only because he will be in me. And that is true existence. That is true life. That is true love. Because that I am is the true God and the true love that will never end, will never deceive us, will always be faithful, and will always be there for us. And that is a reality because God is here among us. To end this reflection, I want to share with you something very special that happened to me in Portugal. A few years back, I was given a retreat in the island of Madeira, city of Funchal, to the youth. And uh, before lunch break, we had a session of questions and answers. And one of the students asked me a question that anybody would think is a silly question, but I didn't think it was. He asked me, why is God invisible? So I, I told him, I'm not going to answer it now. I, I answer it when I come back from the lunch break. So I went to adoration, and I told Jesus, Lord, what are you going to tell him? I don't have an answer, but I just don't want to just say, just because that's the way it is. That's the easiest answer. And, the, and it's perfect answer too. But I say, there has to be a way. I was there for 45 minutes. Nothing was coming to my heart. All of a sudden, I had the most amazing answer from Jesus. So simple. He told me, I am not invisible. I am perfectly visible. You have to become perfect so that you can see me. And that is the end of it. When I told the youngsters, they were silent and joyful because it is the answer. You see, God is perfectly visible. Only that we are imperfect in love. And there, if we learn to love perfectly, we will see God because God is the perfection of all things. is love itself. So therefore, if we become perfect, we will see him. And Jesus in the Gospels tells us that. He said, be perfect and holy as my Father is perfect and holy. That way you will enter the kingdom of God forever. In the glory of God, you will live forever. And this is something very important. So God is in our midst all of the time. Only that we are imperfect and we cannot see him. But he is so perfectly present. So let's only search for that perfection. Let's only strive to be perfect. Because can you imagine anything better than being able to see God? I don't think there's anything better than that. And I think that should be our only goal, our ultimate goal, to strive to see the Lord face to face one day. The greatest joy of, I mean, ever, ever, ever. Who could imagine anything better than that? But sometimes the world is so deceiving that we don't even have the desire to see God. The world is so enchanting that we don't even think about going to heaven. A lot of Catholics. I did a few months ago in the U.S. a little interview with a friend of mine. Um, 
outside a few churches, and we were asking people coming out of mass, they say, excuse me, um, do you really dream about being in heaven? Is that a, an important dream in your life? How many times have you dreamt about being in heaven? How many times have you knelt and asked the Lord to take you to heaven? You'd be surprised what people answer. Very few people have done it. And you ask yourself, where are people going at the end of this life? What is their desire? Where are they going to go? Where is their hearts? Is heaven here? I don't think so. You see, then where are they going? What are the ultimate dream? If, you, if heaven is not your home in your heart, then where is it that you belong to? To earth? That will be a big problem because earth is going to be over soon. And then what's going to happen with your soul? Where is it going to go? Your soul is not able to survive on earth because to survive on earth, you need a physical body. And what happens when the body is gone? You're not able to survive here. You are not able to do anything here. So where is your soul going to go? Think about that. It's very simple. It's a very simple law. So it better be a good dream of our life to be in heaven and to have a desire for the glory of God, a desire to be with God, a desire to reunite ourselves with God forever. It should be. And I know that the same way you see people online to come to the Eucharist and you know they are not hungry for the Eucharist, that is the same way you see people not hungry for heaven. So let's start from the ground. Let's beg the Lord to give us a hunger for the Eucharistic bread, to give us hunger for the body of Jesus, because that way we will eventually be hungry for heaven, because that Eucharist will give us the search for the eternal glory of God. But then be, be, let's begin by asking the Lord for a Eucharistic hunger, because if we don't have hunger for the bread of life, we are starving spiritually, and at the end of this life, it's going to be worst. So may God give us Eucharistic hunger so that we can begin to have the desire of eternal salvation. May the Lord bless each one of you, each one of your families. May you be the tower of light of this community, of your family, of humanity, of the church. Amen.